So let me uh, formally introduce to you our guest, Charles Waterfield, uh, whose uh, profession is clearly an art historian, but the occupation hardly could be described in Russian in one word. A curator, a director of a gallery, an advisor, a trustee, um, the per a person who does everything at once and who is able to do so many things and to, I presume, organize so many things. When I was reading Joe's biography and references to him on the internet, I was very much impressed how much he was able to do and I hope how much he will do in the future. So, Joss Waterfield, uh, I'm, when I saw him the day before yesterday, I had the feeling that he's, he's somebody very British came. The air, the style, the way he speaks, uh, replies, <coughs> that sense of humor, he doesn't demonstrate every moment, but it, it exists and you can feel it. And the biography of our guest, this again seems to be very British. I'm speaking about Russian stereotypes about Britain, clearly. He uh, studied at Eton, Paragraph, a Magdalen College, Oxford, and the Courtauld Institute of Arts. What would be more impressive for a foreigner? And he started his career, if, um, if I write, in the Royal, Royal, Royal Pavilion in Brighton, one of the most bizarre buildings in the 19th century. Uh, and then I think the crucial point was the, that when you uh, was a director of the Dalvish Gallery, a unique institution, uh, the building itself was a work of art, a genius built by Sir John Sohn. And uh, that time it was already advanced, but I have a feeling that Giles was able to turn that uh, pre-modern uh, radical building to uh, uh, heaven for modern contemporary art. So uh, we m m may speak a lot about his career. Uh, I don't, uh, but what again impresses me a lot that spirit of, I don't think you, uh, you do everything easy, but it seems that you enjoy what you do. I hope so. Mostly, yeah. Mostly. Uh, so, what else should I say to not to be too, uh, too long and boring? Uh, Again, something very British, which makes Charles exceptional even in Britain. Not extremely exceptional, but his portrait belongs to the collection of National Portrait Gallery. Am I right? Well, a little photograph, yeah. Yeah, but, but it's there. So, uh, what uh, the book we are going to present to you uh, is important from my point of view and we know what it's about because of the yesterday's lecture for it tells us how what we do as art historians is important in social terms in social context how what was considered and still considered very often the, the grand art that realm of beauty is indeed related to people's needs and how British society was able to turn it to a healing force uh, which probably was one of the reasons besides common sense and sense of humor uh, that Britain didn't suffer the revolution as many European nations. So the study, this research is very impressive for it deals with different museums, different social groups, different patrons, 
uh, in different audiences, but it shows to which extent art was part of social life of England and active social agent. And indeed, I would be happy if we one day have such a study of Russian museums and galleries. I hope Andre is the one who can perform such a study. And now let me stop and give the panel to Giles. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, what I want to do today is to, this evening, is to talk about uh, the book that I've written, a little bit about the background of the book, and uh, about the way in which I feel this subject is interesting and, and important. This book, of which we don't have a copy in the room, do we? Oh, we do, up there, it's up there, uh, is um, uh, called The People's Galleries, and it's about Victorian, it's about art, museums, art galleries, art museums in Britain between 1800 and the First World War. Uh, it's a subject that I started thinking about quite a long time ago, about 25 years ago. And um, at that time, the subject of museum history in British academic circles was really just being born. It was a major exhibition at the Ashmolean in the 1980s in which international scholars contributed articles, essays, on the subject, Cabinets of Curiosities. Uh, and then since I, since I started writing, thinking about this subject, there has been a, uh, quite a considerable number of publications. Uh, some of them are individual histories of institutions, such as the British Museum, the National Gallery, the Tate Gallery, which and sometimes interesting, and sometimes not very interesting. Uh, and then there was in the 90s a very vigorous um, succession of books of critical theory, uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, in which the ideas of Michel Foucault and uh, many other theoretical writers were applied to museums, which were, as I'm sure you know, criticized as agents of oppression, of the manipulation of the working classes by the established orders in society, and so on and so forth. Uh, there have been some very interesting things written, but uh, on the whole it remains a relatively undeveloped field. And one thing that I feel very strongly is that uh, even when writers attempt to address the question uh, in fairly broad terms, they tend not to be very international in their approach. So it's very interesting to come here and talk to some of you about <coughs> comparable developments in, in Russia during the 19th century, uh, for example. I was originally going to write a history that would stretch from the 17th century when the first museums were set up in Britain. Uh, up to the present, present, which is always marching on, obviously. Uh, but I decided that that would be difficult and not very rewarding. So I concentrated on this phenomenon, which I find very interesting, of the large art museums outside London uh, in, the, in the century of their creation. Now, a few general remarks about collecting in, in Britain. Um, I show you here the Grand Corridor, Windsor Castle. Uh, this is uh, taken about 1835. Um, the corridor had existed for 10 years. Uh, it had been installed by King George IV. Uh, it was filled with um, paintings, portraits. It was a personal island gallery, a gallery of ancestors, but also of friends. Um, it contained, however, also his collection of French furniture, uh, Boulle particularly, Sèvres, and so on and so forth. So it was a, a personal gallery, and it survives, and it's a castle. And the Queen's bedroom is somewhere up there on the right. It's not open to the public. I show you this because it illustrates, first of all, the fact that unlike Russia, uh, and unlike almost all European countries, 
the British Royal Collection has remained in the possession of the Royal Family. And secondly, the extraordinary richness of private collections in Britain um, during, the, during the 18th and 19th centuries, which play a sort of part uh, in my history. Um, the first public galleries in, I use the term gallery, uh, I was asked about this yesterday, um, it's interchangeably really with art museum. Uh, the, the first public gallery is Dulwich Picture Gallery, where I used to work, opened in 1817. Uh, interesting because it um, contained a major collection of old master paintings, because it was designed by the great uh, architect Sir John Soane, and because it contained a tomb for the founders. Uh, this central building um, was a personal uh, mausoleum and it reflects the role of private patronage in Britain at a time when there was yet, as yet no national gallery. The men who created this gallery thought that they ought to play their role uh, in establishing um, such an institution. So here is the interior of the gallery as it first looked, uh, with the paintings, as you see, hung very thickly, uh, top lighting, and a very scientific gallery for the time, I mean, very advanced, when the architects for the Sainsbury Wing of the National Gallery were interviewed 30 years ago and asked what their favourite museum building was, they all apparently said Dulwich Picture Gallery. Uh, however, what I want to stress is that this was, it went to a college, uh, but it was, it was a private collection and it initiates a long tradition of private uh, philanthropy in Britain. At the same time, there is a long tradition of public meanness, of public uh, unwillingness to spend money on the arts. Um, and this is a tradition that lasts from the 18th century to the present and is still quite active. And I don't know whether there was any reflection of this in Russia in the 19th century. This is a cartoon of 1828, and it shows above the National Gallery of France, which is the Grand Gallery of the Louvre, and then below the National Gallery of England, uh, which is this house that had been taken over and filled with the existing collection, uh, was housed in that, and the moral of this drawing is obviously, uh, I think, very clear. Now, in my talk, um, I would, uh, I'm told, I, I hope I can indicate what I, you don't have a stick, do you? Okay. Or something. Um, uh, you, you know what, where this is. Um, uh, the history that I'm particularly interested in is not the history of, as I say, of, of museums in London, although they play a very important part. It's really the history of the great expanding cities of the Industrial Revolution. And they are very much centered in that area up there and further down. And I'll be able to illustrate more clearly what I mean in a moment. So um, just to go on for a moment, here we have some of the greatest cities, Liverpool on the one hand, Port, um, extremely rich, well-established, cosmopolitan, probably resembling St. Petersburg in some ways, uh, with very strong international connections, particularly if you go to Liverpool now, they say this is the, this is the New York of Europe, uh, and close by its great rival, uh, Manchester, uh, about which I'll say a little more. And then all around it, particularly to the north, are other cities, you, other towns you may not have heard of, but which nevertheless <coughs> were all extremely wealthy uh, as a result of the cotton trade uh, in particular. Liverpool as a port, the others as, as, as um, producers of, of cotton. And these cities expanded enormously in the 19th century. So here I show you a graph. Ah, fantastic. Great, thank you. So um, the areas that I'm particularly concerned with are here, Liverpool, Manchester, 
uh, this area in Yorkshire, Leeds, Bradford, and then certain areas, Birmingham, Nottingham, here, in the middle of the country. But there is very little going on in the south, uh, in this part, in Wales, but Glasgow is also important up there. So it's, it's a quite restricted, but extremely wealthy, vigorous, and um, uh, dynamic part of, of the country. This gives you some idea of the expansion of population. So you have Liverpool rising from 80,000 population in 1800 to 700,000 100 years later. Glasgow from the same up to uh, three quarters of a million, etc. These cities expanded with tremendous rapidity. And I show you just a few uh, images to give you an idea of how these cities looked. Uh, Glasgow, Liverpool, um, a view of the seafront, this great port, uh, this um, uh, place that, that considered itself extremely uh, refined, classical, learned, where no mention was made of the principal original source of revenue, which was the slave trade, uh, which flourished in Liverpool right up to the to the 1830s. These buildings give you some impression of how Liverpool uh, saw itself, this great classical structure, St George's Hall, which contained a courts of justice, a concert hall, and so on, a really magnificent building um, in the grandest classical tradition, because Liverpool saw itself as a classical city. Uh, here is the interior of the hall, uh, with a with an horse, with a, a party of some sort going on, and I think this gives you an idea of the sense of um, pride and ambition that such a city possessed. Here is a view of the uh, of Liverpool again. Um, with this, the station is here, and here is a um, what we have the, the closest that we have a sort of cultural forum in a great city outside London. Uh, what, it, what we do not have in these cities is the sort of sense of planning and grandeur that is so remarkable here in St. Petersburg. And I think there are all sorts of reasons for this, some of them political, some of them economic. Uh, but if you visit these cities, you will find there are splendid buildings, but they don't tend to be organized in a very coherent way in the style of this extraordinary city, St. Petersburg. Nevertheless, here you have St. George's Hall, uh, the museum, the library, the Walker Art Gallery, the Courts of Justice, and, uh, and so forth. I'll run through these fairly soon, fairly fast. Uh, the town halls in these cities celebrated the fact that these were places of extreme wealth. Uh, Leeds was a textile town and uh, the citizens saw themselves as uh, upholders of a great tradition. They built themselves this, as you see, classical uh, building with a huge central hall painted with um, subjects of the greatness of, of Leeds uh, in the past. Um, and with this tower, this rather strange um, a futuristic tower. Here is Manchester, uh, choosing here a Gothic style, a little bit later, an enormous uh, town hall. And you would imagine that these towns were well planned and, and happily inhabited, but that was not the case. Um, oh, I don't think we need to move on that. Just one or two views of, you know, civic life, how pleasant uh, these places must have been. Uh, Sheffield, uh, on the one hand, uh, a great producer of steel, um, on the other hand, a place where agricultural activity, an old market, is still being run. The Manchester Ship Canal, um, the canals being one of the ways in which all these towns formed a kind of great network of uh, economic power. And then in the later 19th century, uh, they begin to build arcades, such as this. So Birmingham, for example, a very wealthy city, was famous for its arcades, very much in the same way that uh, St. Petersburg became. And uh, these reflect a new 
attitude to urban living, the urbane, uh, civilized uh, approach to um, consumerism, to shopping, to shopping as a kind of leisure activity. On the other hand, uh, these cities were famous for their appalling living conditions. This is a very interesting photograph. The first photograph, it is claimed, uh, the first series, one of the first series of photographs of a slum area. Uh, in the 1850s, it was decided that the slums of Glasgow in the old city had to be demolished because they were so unhealthy. And uh, a series of photographs were commissioned from this man, Annan, of these old buildings, many of them medieval or 16th century buildings. And so he... Um, uh, uh, he uh, arranged members of the, of the local population, cleaned them up, I think, a little bit, uh, and took these rather poignant um, photographs of um, streets and places that were about to be demolished. Uh, I show you, first of all, um, uh, an illustration which gives you some impression of what Manchester was about. Manchester was the wonder of the world. Uh, Manchester was richer, uh, more productive, more exciting, more dynamic than any city anyone had ever been. If you read the British literature or the French commentators of the period, you can see how they saw Manchester as a sort of great glittering monster. On the one hand, it produced so much uh, energy and so much money, and on the other hand, uh, it was a truly hideous city. And so what is partic was considered particularly shocking about it was the fact that you have on the one hand all these factory chimneys belching out smoke and the great cotton mills where small children were working 12 hours a day and so forth, and then underneath these uh, little houses thrown up at tremendous speed where people lived without proper sanitation and so forth. And there are quite a lot of descriptions from the 1830s onwards of these of cities, and particularly of Manchester, saying that uh, Manchester is a place of um, uh, danger. It's danger. It's dangerous, first of all, because of social unrest. And as you may know, Friedrich Engels spent two years in Manchester he was completely fascinated by it uh, as a phenomenon, but also because he thought that it might well incite violent social revolution. Uh, uh, and it was also dangerous because of its risk to health, because there were cholera epidemics, because there was no sanitation, because people were living in filthy conditions. And one of the things that social commentators said was that this is a danger to you on social grounds and on health grounds that the cholera that kills poor people may kill clergymen, doctors, lawyers, and mill owners. And here's another rather atmospheric late 19th century photograph showing uh, the character of this extraordinary town. In fact, the, the, there are quite a lot of descriptions of the populations of these cities. And uh, the life was, in a way, not as bad as one might suppose. They, are, they seem to have been remarkable people of Manchester for their energy, their enthusiasm, their humour and so forth. Nevertheless, you get an idea of the difficulties that they had to, to face. So what, um, what was to be done? Well, this was the great question that really underlies my book. Uh, the attempt by social reformers, by collectors, by um, members of parliament, particularly radical members of parliament, uh, left-wing members of parliament, to try to rectify this situation. And as I said yesterday, but it is, I think, very interesting, uh, the arts and museums were not regarded as a kind of extra, a means of attracting tourists, or uh, economic boost, or a um, uh, sort of pleasant diversion for ladies. Uh, they were, museums and the arts were seen as absolutely crucial to the well-being, prosperity, and uh, moral health of the population. And this kind of idea of museums as 
just being just as important as hospitals, schools, sanitation, and parks, uh, runs through this whole discourse. Uh, I would compare the museums to the public parks. So here we have the first major public park opened, as you, this is the opening in 1847. Birkenhead is just across the water from uh, Liverpool. Uh, and it was designed by Joseph Paxton, who later designed the Crystal Palace. And you can see um, behind all these elegant people, uh, the serpentine lakes, it's a sort of continuation of the English garden, is it not? Uh, the little picturesque little buildings um, and so forth, somewhat like Pavlov's in a way, uh, about for the people, and um, diversion. So croquet, bowls, cricket, growing, all these healthy things. Um, this was very influential. Uh, Olmsted, the American designer, came here and was inspired when he designed Central Park by this park. But what is particularly important is that it was felt that creating such a place as this would encourage people not to do what they tended to do, but to uh, engage in more healthy activities. And what they tended to do was go to public houses, to inns, and to get very drunk. Uh, particularly the men, it seems to have been seen as especially a male problem, uh, to get very drunk, to go home, uh, to kick their wives around, and uh, so forth. And um, there's a very strong feeling that a healthy, um, popular culture must replace the uh, loose living, uh, debased popular culture which was seen as existing then it's not just a question of drinking beer, too much beer, or gin. Uh, it's a question also of music halls, of, um, uh, of, you know, of, of indelicate uh, entertainments, and so on and so forth. So these museums are very much inspired by the idea, firstly, of entertaining people uh, and educating them, but also of um, uh, entertain of, of, of um, teaching them to lead better lives. I'll show you one or two other examples. This is, at the same time, the mu these museums were being set up, universities were being created around Britain. So here we have um, Glasgow University, an old university, but rebuilt in the 19th century. And in this beautiful park, uh, which I will show you in a moment, in, in a rather different form. Um, in my book, I concentrated really on art museums. There is an art gallery, so there is a, a parallel history which addresses um, museums of natural history, archaeology, and so forth, which develops earlier, um, which tends to be a separate history, which I decided not to concentrate on because there is so much, such an enormous amount of material. But this is Ipswich Museum, which is a very characteristic example. I'm sure you have museums like this in St. Petersburg, uh, where the gallery around, top lighting, showcases, partly for instruction, partly for study, and partly for um, the entertainment of the public, but really a study collection rather than uh, a place of resort. Very important here is the whole tradition of public education. And again, I would, I would stress that these museums uh, were part of a very major campaign, and again, I don't know whether this is comparable to what happened in Russia, of um, uh, education for people who had not been to proper schools. Our school system was very bad um, right through the 19th century, uh, and who certainly had not been to university. So on the one hand, you have these free libraries, and on the other hand, you have mechanics institutes like this one. And a mechanics institute uh, was a place where working men could go and improve their skills, could learn mathematics, uh, accounting, could improve their trade skills or whatever, and possibly learn about geography and history and, and even art. Uh, and the, this kind of place, which was usually funded by the wealthy, the benefit of the poor, again, is part of this whole fabric of education in, in 19th century Britain. 
Also very important is the culture of exhibitions. And something that I became very aware of in writing this book is how crucial exhibitions were in the creation of these museums. It seems to me that an element that has been given insufficient attention, really. Um, uh, the Great Exhibition has received a huge amount of um, coverage in academic literature, generally very negative. Um, it's seen from Walter Benjamin onwards as a triumph of consumerism, as the presentation of vast numbers of useless objects uh, which are elevated into uh, icons for the benefit of a um, gullible population. Um, that's not how it was seen at the time. Uh, here is Queen Victoria uh, opening it. Bijou in white. It's up there. Uh, and it was seen by the people of the time as a, um, a way of bringing together the, the peoples of the world. That everyone, whether all countries, whether in their own right or as colonies, would send in objects and would be united in brotherly affection. From my point of view, what is particularly fascinating about this is that it was this sort of huge popular phenomenon. And I, I think it's, uh, there may well have been other manifestations that were comparable to this beforehand, certainly the similar trade exhibitions in France. But what was remarkable about the Great Exhibition was that in the time of the railway, it attracted six million people and uh, made a very considerable financial profit. Um, it was also important, I think, because it was appealing and enjoyable, because uh, although you were possibly deafened and exhausted by going round and looking at the, ex at the exhibits, nevertheless, there were refreshment rooms and which was an innovation in this kind of place, I think. So somebody yesterday told me I was wrong, very politely. Um, comparable to that was a more cultural type of exhibition, the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition. And again, it's symptomatic of this incredible energy of the Victorian age in, in Britain and elsewhere. That's to say, the Manchester Art Treasures Exhibition was set up in a period of a year in a temporary, in a temporary building. Uh, it was arranged by a group of Manchester businessmen who wished to prove that Manchester was as cultivated as Liverpool. Uh, it represented the whole of art as it was seen to be at the time. I don't know what the representation of Russian art was, but I think, I'm afraid, probably not very, not very good. Um, but there we are. Uh, it showed paintings, drawings, glass, furniture, protective arts, weapons, works on paper, and so on. And it was entirely drawn from British collections. It followed the publication by Gustav Wagen of his book, Treasures of Art in Great Britain. And it was intended to be a celebration of the greatness of British collections. And I should say the very common um, theme throughout these uh, uh, exhibitions was that the owners of major works of art were expected to lend them, um, morally expected to lend them to such exhibitions. And so nearly all these things came from major private collections, which were still intact in the 1850s uh, before beginning to be dispersed from the 1870s onwards. Um, this view of the opening of the Manchester exhibition I think it's a very good impression of the sort of overwhelming nature of these events. I mean, these hundreds of people, thousands of people assembled, all gathered together to listen to the mighty organ play. And uh, at the, one of the features of the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition was that it was also very much oriented towards music. So they um, appointed as director of music part of the exhibition a man called Charles Halle, a German, uh, who uh, created an orchestra called the Halle Orchestra, which still exists. And they uh, had annual, they had weekly concerts, which were enormously popular. People took this exhibition very seriously. Some visitors would go and spend uh, two weeks in Manchester, go every day to the exhibition. But nevertheless, it only attracted about a million visitors, 
but it did introduce the idea that major art exhibitions could take place in the regions. Uh, I show you a couple of other a couple of other examples. This is Kelvin Grove, um, which I've just shown you. That's the uh, present art gallery and museum. That's a university building, which you saw in a very different um, view. And then there's this huge uh, pavilion and a series of other pavilions set around this idyllic spot. This is the exhibition of 1888. This attracted 8, 12 million people. I mean, they were extraordinary events. And the spirit of commercialism, of entrepreneurship, of adventure seems to be characteristic of these galleries about which I'm going to talk more in a moment. Uh, another one, 1911, an entirely fabricated palace of history, which establishes that Scotland has very little, has great little to do with England, with Scandinavia, and very little, sorry, to great to do with France, Scandinavia, but not much to do with England. One of the morals of these galleries was that you could help yourself was that you, however poor uh, and modest your background, could, if you worked hard, learn and benefit. And this book by Sam, this rather nauseating book by Samuel Smiles, I don't know if it was translated into Russian, um, was enormously popular, went through many editions, and it says in it, it gives many instances of people who have started with very humble backgrounds and gone on to become rich. And this is one of the great messages of the galleries. This man, Henry Willard, um, is typical of the individuals who founded these new museums. Henry Willard was a, um, a man of wealth. Uh, he was quite strongly left-wing. Uh, he had a major collection of political literature. Uh, he would read aloud passages from the literature to audiences of working men. Thousands of, thousands of people would listen to him. He also had a collection of ceramics, of pots, which he gave to Brighton Museum. And this told the history of England through popular ceramics. So it's very much geared towards a popular didactic style. Here he is with his granddaughter. Um, the other type of person who was much involved in setting up these museums was the curator. But I have to say, curators were a very uh, mixed group. Um, there was no teaching of art history, unlike the teaching of the natural sciences, which was fully developed. Um, art history was not taught, and uh, many of the people appointed to these positions had very few qualifications for them. Uh, this is an exception, Whitworth Wallace, who was for 40 years uh, curator at Birmingham, and he's sitting in a room which seems to me the perfect um, office for a, um, for a museum curator. Okay. Mm, let's skip him. These uh, museum, art museums begin to be set up in the 1860s, and the period where, when they flourish is from 1870 to 1914, the First World War. By the end of that period, almost any town or city with any pretensions had a museum, a scientific museum, and an art museum, often in the same building, but uh, separate. Uh, when this book was written in 1888, the, artist, the author um, chronicled about 150 museums outside London, but only about 15 art museums. So it was a relatively new um, phenomenon but then rapidly increased. You might notice the, uh, the character of the... Is that working? Uh, the character of the building. Um, this is Birmingham Art Gallery. Because of the objections to spending money, public money, they had to uh, make it half a commercial building. Birmingham was an extremely liberal city. Liberal with a capital L, liberal party being the main political opponents, conservatives. Um, it was called as liberal as the sea is salt. Uh, and they took, they nationalized, uh, as it were, the gas service. This was the gas hall downstairs with the art gallery upstairs. Uh, and erected, sorry, erected in this curious mixture of classical 
and some sort of French Renaissance tower up there. Um, I'll show you just a few examples. Uh, Birmingham, this is the interior of Birmingham Art Gallery about 1880. And what this stresses is, first of all, the fact that Birmingham was already collecting quite a lot of pictures, many of them by local artists, uh, and this is a very important element of these galleries, but also um, uh, didactic pieces that were intended to improve the quality of design. And so here we have uh, uh, a very interesting example of the influence of the South Kensington Museum, now the Victoria and Albert Museum, which was set up in the 1860s and which contain uh, works of art that were um, decorative arts, sometimes reproductions, sometimes original pieces, which were intended to encourage designers, manufacturers, craftsmen to uh, uh, produce a better uh, type of design. And I am going tomorrow to see, am I not, the Stieglitz Museum. Is that the correct title? Yes, it is. Uh, which I think is a direct sort of brother to this kind of museum, a museum of design, um, which was, had a, a particular educational function. So that's one view of, uh, of Birmingham. Uh, I show you here Nottingham Castle. And this is, um, this is a very interesting um, case study. Nottingham Castle Museum was created in the 1870s. This was the place where Robin Hood shot the Sheriff of Nottingham. And um, still today, Japanese tourists arrive hoping to see the rooms where the Sheriff of Nottingham lived, but they're rather disappointed to find exhibitions of 20th century ceramics. <laughs> Um, this belonged to the Dukes of, of um, Newcastle, a great Baroque palace, as you can see from outside. Uh, in 1831, when the Parliamentary Reform Bill was being discussed in Parliament, uh, the Duke of Newcastle was very reactionary, voted against parliamentary reform. Nottingham was a, a terrible town. I mean, it had very, very bad social conditions. And what did the people of Nottingham did? They, um, they uh, surged up the hill, they set the house on fire, and it was completely gutted. Uh, and um, it's, there was more rebellion and social dissension in 19th century Britain than actually you might suppose. But this was a very strong symbolic gesture. So here was this empty building, the uh, ruined castle, which 40 years later becomes the castle of the people, the castle museum. So the old walls remained uh, with some alterations, and inside it uh, were installed galleries, which have a slightly historical character actually to them, but nevertheless they were galleries for the people. And there are interesting accounts of how the population of Nottingham again rushed up the hill but this time not to set it on fire, not to set the castle on fire, but to look at pictures, which they'd hardly seen. But the position is, you know, is interesting and significant. Here it is dominating uh, the town, which is you know, right down beneath it. Here is the, the long gallery of um, Nottingham Castle when it first opened. And you can see it's like a, a nobleman's uh, long gallery in a way uh, top-lit in a scientific manner, but with the architectural features uh, reflecting the um, aristocratic character of the former building, and then the pictures hung three or four deep in the style of the time. Uh, on the theme of the temporary exhibition, Nottingham Castle uh, opened with a temporary exhibition drawn from many different collections. Uh, at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, um, there was no collection when it first opened. Uh, it owned, it um, was intended, uh, it was a great classical building as you can see. Uh, you see the plan, it was relatively modest in size. Uh, and it contained, when it opened, one permanent work of art, which was the statue of Alderman Walker. Um, but it was intended for exhibitions. 
It was clearly a Kunsthalle. It had a big autumn exhibition every year with about a thousand works uh, on loan for sale. Uh, and then um, otherwise it held naval exhibitions and uh, uh, temporary exhibitions of all sorts. And it was only gradually that the permanent collection uh, came into existence. I show you this, which I did explain yesterday, but I think it's worth saying again. Um, uh, the, 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 the upper one. Sorry? The upper one. The upper. Um, this is a, um, a caricature made at the time that the Walker Art Gallery opened. The Walker was paid for by a man called Alderman Walker, who was anxious to become Lord Mayor of Liverpool. His problem was that he made his money in alcohol. And alcohol was not viewed as a nice thing. It was viewed in many circles as a major social threat. Uh, and. Um, he paid, for the, for, he paid for the gallery, he became Lord Mayor of Liverpool in the following year. And this, um, this uh, caricature was produced, a fresco for the Walker Art Gallery, which shows you the dangers of alcohol. This is a caricature figure of, uh, of drink and death, uh, with the barrel from which a snake emerges, and the uh, story depicts Two, the lives of two men, one of whom throws himself into the water and the other whom, of whom is hanged, while their wives end up in uh, wretched penury in the, in the poorhouse. So this gives you an idea again of some of the social tensions around these places, but also of the sort of people who were involved in setting up these places. They were on the whole funded by the local city, but the men who set them up were a particular type. They were nearly all, almost all men, um, with one particular exception. Uh, they were self-made men. They were not members of the Church of England. They were not Jewish. They were not Roman Catholics. They were non-conformists uh, in religious terms. They had not been to university. Uh, they were usually major philanthropists, interested in a whole range of activities, but who regarded um, the creation of museums as a central activity. And uh, it's, it's, you know, interesting and um, difficult to analyse these people, but I think on the whole they were motivated by a desire to improve the lives of their fellow citizens and to be personally commemorated. Uh, another example, this is Harris Art Gallery, which showed the entire history of um, art from um, Assyria down at the bottom, ancient Assyria up to modern Lancashire, up at the top. Uh, a typical structure in that it contained the library on the, on the ground floor. I don't know if it's a tall or Russian a type, a public library, and then originally a very grand flight of stairs leading up to the museum <coughs> and the art gallery above. Um, just one or two interiors, the role of the, uh, this is the interior, as you see, of that same building. Uh, the reproduction is very important in these places. And it was felt in many circles that reproductions, whether they're photographs or engravings or casts uh, or electrotypes, could play the part of original objects. People in London often thought that the provinces were not worthy to receive uh, major works of art. And so, obviously, they're not going to get Michelangelo's David, but they did obtain this huge statue of him, and here's a little man for scale beside him, and surrounded by uh, uh, many types of photographic reproduction and engraving. Obviously, uh, a gallery that's intended to have a strong educational purpose. Here's a Renaissance room in the same in the same sequence. At Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, which is one of the finest of these ensembles, um, you've already seen it in different forms, but this, again, is an illustration of the importance of exhibitions, because um, these huge exhibitions that I've mentioned at Kelvin Grove paid for a building like this, an enormous structure 
which housed the museum on the ground floor, the art gallery on the upper floor, uh, and which um, was paid for by a bit of profit of one of these vast shows, designed in a sort of um, eclectic style, which was usually called Renaissance. These galleries are very popular, and one of the um, most interesting things about them is how many people visited them. So that there were regular uh, visitor figures, the curators were very interested in their public, they took a lot of interest in how many people went and how people behaved. They seem to have spent a lot of time uh, visiting them. And as I remarked yesterday, I'm not sure that the curators of the Hermitage spend a lot of time watching their public and seeing how they react. Uh, but certainly people did in the 19th century, and they were very anxious that their publics um, should be interested. They saw their role as curators um, as being partly to improve the lives but also to educate the lives of simple people. And what is also significant, and what I, is why I chose the title I did for my book, is that these really were galleries for, for sort, of, sort of relatively simple people, for people who had been educated maybe up to the age of 11 or 10, uh, who were probably intellectually very curious in many cases, but who had not uh, received many advantages, but were anxious, anxious to learn and appreciate. And it is remarkable how active the galleries were in organizing temporary exhibitions and in organizing uh, educational activities such as this picture of a bald man um, explaining this picture to a group of attentive people um, of of mixed social origins, I would say, from their clothes. So they're enormously popular, attracting hundreds of thousands of visitors up to about 1900, which I'll mention at the end. Now, just a word about the collections that they made. They bought, they had all sorts of things. Uh, they had machines and they had sculpture and so on, but they didn't, on the whole, have old master paintings. Uh, old master paintings were firstly expensive and secondly, not to the taste of the collectors. And thirdly, um, I think not um, considered particularly appropriate for uh, the audiences. So Dutch painting, um, like this little picture, uh, was quite popular. And it is a taste. Go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York and look at the Dutch collection. You can see uh, these very wealthy people 100, 100, 120 years ago liked to buy works that their predecessors in the Netherlands bought in the 17th century. But this is the only sort of kind of um, old master that enters in any strength. Joshua Reynolds and Gainsborough and the uh, great British portraits were hardly to be seen in these collections. Um, this is a very rare example, a, a picture, a portrait of uh, Reynolds's father, uh, and it was given to Plymouth because Reynolds came from Plymouth. So the tradition of creating um, galleries that reflect the character of a particular neighbourhood is quite strong, and is also significant because of this lesson. You too, you too, you come from Liverpool or Plymouth, you too can follow the example uh, of this great man. In a few cases, the museums um, did uh, buy things that hadn't really been rediscovered. So John Crome, uh, an artist of uh, Norfolk, was bought uh, extensively by, by the local gallery. But the sort of themes that were more popular um, were uh, landscapes, uh, John Ruskin, very articulate on the subject, said that uh, for people living in uh, slums, unable to go to the countryside, to have a view of country scenes, the sort of scene that they would have, in, that their grandparents or their parents would have witnessed, uh, was very important. So there's quite a large number of these, of these nostalgic landscapes. This is a painting that. Um, is, I think, core to the character of these places. That's to say, it shows um, 
a scene in the Westminster Union. The Union was the poorhouse, the workhouse. It was a place where, if you were financially destitute, you could go and you would be given somewhere to sleep and something to eat. But they were made deliberately as unpleasant as possible. I don't know if you had the same system in Russia. Uh, as unpleasant as possible, so as to discourage anyone from going. Even tide here does not refer to the time of day, it refers to the lives of these aged ladies. And uh, you can see they're drinking their tea or whatever they're doing and tottering up and down. And there is an account of a lecture given in uh, Manchester in 1906 when the audience burst into applause. It was a lantern slide lecture. They burst into applause when they saw this picture because it spoke to them. It reflected their own way of life, that their mothers or their grandmothers might have ended their lives like this. And this kind of direct popular art seems to me to be at the core of this whole movement, for better or, or not for better. Uh, in a few cases they bought works by the Pre-Raphaelites, so I show you, for example, um, William Holman Hunt. Pre-Raphaelites very controversial, considerably difficult, uh, only bought by the most um, advanced of curators, but they did make some magnificent collections. Here again is the influence of uh, John Ruskin, very strong. Ruskin was a keen admirer of this artist. Excuse me. Uh, John Brett, and here you see this type of uh, realistic painting, hyper-realist, very detailed, a strong moral message um, in which um, every detail is, is minutely depicted. Rosa Bonheur, some foreign painters bought, not on the whole very many. Rosa Bonheur, expensive, highly, highly admired. Fontaine Latour might enter the collections, but only from uh, very wealthy um, private owners who might give such works to their, to their collections. Uh, sculpture did play a role, and, but on the whole, sculpture tended to depict the lives of great citizens of a particular country. So James Watt, inventor of the steam engine, um, it's a rather unkind photograph, but uh, suggesting that it's not as much admired as it used to be, but this kind of idea of uh, a gallery of the famous citizens of a town uh, was something that played quite a uh, predominant role. And in Liverpool in particular, this great classical city, as I've mentioned, such works as this uh, were greatly admired. John Gibson was a Liverpool man uh, who worked in Rome much of his life. And this was a work that caused enormous sensation when it was first exhibited because it explored the idea of colour in classical antiquity. It attempted to reintroduce um, tints and colours into a modern classical painting. Well, um, I haven't shown you the most extreme examples of this kind of popular art, but I hope you get an idea of the kind of taste. There was in Liverpool um, Art gallery, a kind of parallel movement where the, uh, the authorities said, on the one hand, we will collect popular works that will appeal to an uneducated public and amuse and please them, and on the other hand, we will buy interesting works by our European artists which will be considered of value in the future. But many didn't do that. Around 1900, very briefly, uh, around 1900, the reputation of these galleries tends to waver, to decline. Um, first of all, because Victorian painting is going drastically out of fashion. Um, secondly, because there were so many more attractions. You could go to big football matches, uh, you could go shopping, you could go uh, to the cinema, which really was a crucial little funny cinemas you know, where you could sit and watch a film that lasted five minutes in a room half a quarter the size of this one. Uh, but nevertheless, the cinema was much more exciting than looking at landscape paintings, really. Uh, and also, I think, a change in, in attitudes. The idea of liberal patronage from above 
no longer seemed as acceptable as it had been to the past. So this very fascinating movement in the uh, first decade of the 20th century, when at a place like Brighton Art Gallery and others, um, enlightened curators started introducing um, works that had not previously been seen in England. In Britain, we make a great deal of the two great exhibitions of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist art, organized by Roger Fry. But actually, in Brighton, they had been showing works by Monet and Dugas, Renoir, Gauguin, um, César, earlier than that. And Lucien Pissarro, French artist living in England, said that the exhibitions in these cities were more adventurous than the exhibitions to be found in French cities. So there is a more kind of intellectual and exploratory approach, but at the same time, the audiences, as I say, dropped severely. And by the First World War, they were sort of half what they had been 10, 15 years earlier. And this, to conclude, uh, in the 20th century, these galleries have had a very uh, mixed um, history. <coughs> After the Second World War, they enjoyed a renaissance. There was a feeling very strongly in Britain at that time after the, first, after the Second World War that we were entering a new age, a new glorious socialist age, not carried quite as far as in this country. Uh, and also a feeling that great art was appropriate for everyone, that um, everyone whatever their origins, should be encouraged to enjoy Mozart and Beethoven, Stockhausen, to look at um, major works of art, etc., etc. And so Birmingham, Manchester, started buying old master paintings on the art market, which was fairly cheap, actually, at the time. So you could buy works by, you know, Petrus Christus, or Orazio Gentileschi, or whoever it might be, at the a thousand, two or three thousand pounds. So that's the period when the great old master collections are assembled. This period continued until um, the 80s, and you may all be great admirers of Margaret Thatcher, uh, but Margaret Thatcher and her government really um, cut the uh, roots out from these galleries, um, the local government found itself with very little money. The budgets were uh, um, collapsed. They were revived by the Heritage Lottery Fund in the 1990s, and they are now in a terrible state. And having, in a very, very short time, to try and adapt from having, from the old tradition of essentially being supported by the city, by public funds, to becoming commercial enterprises. So the director of York Museums recently said, uh, you know, we have to, we have to realize that we are no longer um, services, we are, we are businesses. At the same time, there is an interesting um, change in, in approach. And again, I'd be interested to know whether this is something that's happened in, in Russia. Uh, here is the Western Park Museum in Sheffield, which has an interesting collection of 19th century, 20th century, and older art. Uh, here it is as recently redisplayed um, in the newly redecorated building. I haven't actually seen it, but um, you can see there are 17th century portraits, uh, there are uh, all sorts of objects mixed up. Um, and the photograph chosen by the museum, which I'm not criticizing, I'm merely illustrating, is making a very strong message that art is accessible and, enjoy and enjoyable to all and should that an art gallery, an art museum, particularly in the provinces, should finally be about family audiences. And it seems to me that, you know, it's very interesting to compare the original aims of these places in the 1870s and 80s, which were intending to be, intended to be as accessible and enjoyable as possible for everybody, with the aims of these galleries, which again are trying to make themselves 
as accessible and enjoyable as possible, but sometimes at very major uh, sacrifice of other possibilities. Thank you very much.